The Compromise of 1850 appeared to have settled the slavery issue in as, so far as national politics was concerned. Uh, in 1852, the Free Soil Party was uh, pretty, uh, you know, got very few votes. Uh, both major parties, the Democrat and the Whig, endorsed the Compromise of 1850. Franklin Pierce, a Democrat from New Hampshire, was elected by a landslide in the election of 1852. And so everything seemed settled, right? But of course it wasn't. And within another year or two, the whole political system blows up over this question of the expansion of slavery. That brings us to the leading political figure of the 1850s, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois. Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, the major political leader of the 1850s, the little giant, as he was called. Douglas was born in Vermont in 1813, a year after his great antagonist Lincoln was born, no, no, a few years after Lincoln was born in, um, in, uh, in Kentucky. Um, he moved to Illinois, went into politics, and became what you might almost call a Western sectionalist. He didn't see himself as a northerner or a southerner, and many will like this. He saw himself as a westerner. Western development was the key to the nation's future. He was a strong believer in local self-government, most Democrats were, um, westward expansion, strong supporter of the Mexican War, uh, manifest destiny, as they called it, this destiny of the United States to expand. Uh, he believed the United States should invade Canada and seize that. He believed we should get Cuba. He was reckless, he was optimistic, he was impulsive. In 1852, at the age of 39, which is young in this sense, he tried to get the Democratic nomination for president, and the more established party leaders were quite annoyed at him for that. As I said, Douglas had piloted the Compromise of 1850 to passage, and in a way, Douglas in the 1850s is the last of the great compromise politicians, the last great politician whose career is built on unity, trying to find bonds of unity between North and South rather than speaking for a particular section. And he embraced and became more associated than anyone else with this doctrine, popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty, let the people of the territories decide for themselves whether they want slavery or not. Um, and this, had the, this was a middle ground between anti-slavery, pro-slavery. It would take slavery out of national politics. It would prevent it from disrupting the Democratic Party. And um, it was the only way to get the territories organized and settled, because otherwise you'd have this constant fights in Congress about whether they should be slave or not. Doug, but more than that, and this is something hard to quite fathom, but very important, Douglas thought about the slavery issue purely in political terms, not moral terms of any kind. He disliked the anti-slavery agitation. Um, he was deeply racist, but many people were in the North. Slavery, he said, was a local Southern institution of no concern to the North. He said, if I were living in the South, I would not want, uh, no, if I were, if someone came to me and said, we should have slavery in Illinois, I'd say, no, I don't want slavery in Illinois, but it is not my business to determine what institutions the people of Mississippi have. Um, in other words, even more deeply than that, politicians should not deal in the currency of moral issues. Moral issues are not political issues. Politics is compromised. Moral issues cannot be compromised. Um, the only basis of national politics in a diverse society, he says, is respect for difference, local self-government. If they want slavery, that's cool. Not my problem. I don't want slavery here. They have no right to tell me I should have slavery. I have no right to tell them they shouldn't have slavery. This is just local autonomy on this, on this question. Um, keep moral issues out of politics. Here's Douglas's mantra. I deny the right of Congress to force a good thing on a people who do not want it. 
This is the language of, that leads him to oppose, as we'll see, the temperance movement. In other words, the anti-liquor movement. He's, it's, no, you, the government should not tell people how to live their lives. Individual autonomy, local autonomy. Um, the government should not judge the morality of the people. Douglas is against, for example, stopping the delivery of mail on Sunday. You know, they used to deliver mail on Sunday until the 20th century. There were religious groups that constantly, it was a violation of the Sabbath. Most Democrats, Jackson, Doug, said, forget that. It's not the role of the government to impose, if you don't want your mail, don't read it until Monday. But it's not the role of the government to impose a moral or religious standard on everybody. And the same thing about slavery. Now, of course, as we will see, as Lincoln points out in his great debates, the, Douglass's position is totally logical, totally logical and self-contained on most issues. Lincoln says, I don't, look, he's right. They're going to grow cotton in Mississippi. That doesn't mean we have to grow cotton here in Illinois. But there is no conception in this that the black person is an actual human being who might have his own rights and interest in this question. It's all white people deciding what the fate of blacks is. Lincoln says, if you really believe in local self-government, what about the right of a black person to govern himself? That doesn't fit in, D Douglas believes, he does, he says black people are not part of the body politic, and nor Northern, they shouldn't have any rights either. So he's, it, there's a racism beneath the ostensibly non-racial view of the government staying out of moral issues, but, that, but it is a profound political uh, uh, po principle, so to speak, or a, a stance that he, it's not just indifference to slavery, it's a stance of what the government should and should not do.